I'm going to share with you an insight into how risk-based decision-making skills, codified, trained and applied, can transform your business. These skills allow your staff at all levels to make the right calls at the right time for the right reasons. I'm going to discuss why risk-based decision-making is so important in any industry, especially pharma, and highlight how society's perception of risk has changed over the years. And also, what are the top five attributes of a healthy risk-based decision-making process? And of course, I'll direct you to our world-class residential and internal training events, as well as our record-breaking webinar presented by our president, Martin Lush. And remember, you can still watch that webinar for free on NSF's YouTube channel. So why is risk management so critical to society right now? Well, I think we would all agree that society is far more risk averse than it was, for example, in the 1970s. I spent every Saturday for 10 years as a child being driven around central London by my father in an old van with the sliding doors wedged open, with no safety belt, and with my father chain smoking and eating donuts whilst driving through Piccadilly. Unthinkable these days. So be aware that perception of risk changes over time. Making the right choices is a skill and deployment of that skill will define your firm's success or failure. But making decisions when the facts are clear, so-called black or white decisions are often easy. But what about the gray areas? How do you get a complete picture and shrink the gray areas using fact and evidence? Risk-based decision-making is all about making the right choices from the right information in a timely manner, whilst ensuring the choices and information are logical, justifiable, factual, and properly documented. But before you can be sure that the process of information gathering and information evaluation will work well, your firm needs to develop the right culture or mindset. This culture must allow unexpected events errors or non-compliances to be used as a vehicle for continuous improvement. Always mindful that a blame or shame culture will drive issues underground. And these issues will eventually resurface at the worst possible moment and with the worst possible consequences to the end user or patient. So please be aware that the communications, metrics, behaviours and choices that are made at management levels throughout your company hugely influence your staff's choices, those choices on when and how they bring those issues to light. The right culture also hugely influences how your staff will help you, help you to find true root cause and the most effective, corrective and preventive actions. So what are the five key attributes that indicate a healthy, sustainable, risk-based decision-making process? These can be summarized as culture, data, the GEMBA, use of the right tools, and effectiveness checks. So let's look at each one of those in turn. As a leader in your organization, you need to define and influence the operating culture so that issues are effectively and actively brought to the surface. The organization must focus on the root cause of the issue rather than blaming or shaming individuals or departments. Teams must use these events to improve the business through better process definition, knowledge management and coaching. And those teams must be proactive in actually seeking those events out. Remember, ICHQ9 and international CGMPs expect a proactive approach to risk management and proactive business improvement is considerably cheaper and less disruptive than remediation projects. So next in turn, data. Data is king. We all know that, but we also need to know that we need to use more than just data. Good decision makers use the head, the heart and the guts in proportion to the problem to be solved. So here's a question. If data is what influences the head, what influences a decision from the guts? The answer is it's from your experience, drawn from historical data drawn from the combined knowledge of your subject matter experts and your intimate knowledge of the products and processes. But what about the heart? Does the heart have a role to play in effective decision making? Ultimately, when a tough decision has to be made, you should never ignore the key questions like, 
is this the right thing to do? Am I going to regret this decision in the future? And could I justify this decision to my CEO or the regulators or my friends or the parents of the patient who is about to be administered this particular batch of product? So does your heart tell you that this is the right decision? Using head, heart and guts with effective structured decision making tools helps you to make a tough call even when in the grey zone. So next, the Gemba. It's impossible to solve problems via email and from the office, especially when most issues arise on the shop floor or in the laboratory. So please, please, please never neglect the three parts of Gemba. Go see, ask why, and show respect. In this way, you show everyone how important it is to stop and resolve important issues. You show how much you value their input, and as a result, you make faster and more accurate decisions. In walking the job, you avoid letting the gap between shop floor and management become a vast chasm of distrust and misperception. So what about tools? Well, picking the right tool is like picking the right golf club for the shot that you want to take. You wouldn't use a driver to chip onto the green or a putter to get out of the bunker. So it's important to be aware of and practiced in a range of tools. Our courses center on the simple and common tools such as is, is not, and maybe, the five whys, brainstorming and mind mapping, Ishikawa or fishbone diagrams, but we also see a place for risk registers, HACCP, FMEA, six hats thinking, process flow charts, rapid decision making, and each one of those has its place and value. We provide laminated tools, aid memoirs, formats and charts, and we show you when and how to use them and why they are effective in some scenarios more than others. Some of these tools are provided in ICHQ9, and there is no substitute for knowing them, structuring them, deploying them, refining them, and making them an everyday business habit. But how do you know that your decisions are effective? Don't just sit there and keep your fingers crossed. There are three key processes that ensure your decisions are recognizably successful. First, choose clear performance indicators that are insightful and drive the right behaviors and outcomes. Second, focus on preventing recurring deviations. The frequency of recurrence is an indicator of the effectiveness of your kappa. And remember, poor kappa is expensive, it's a distraction, and it's a waste of your finite resources. Thirdly, define an effectiveness check or a protocol that examines whether the risk of recurrence has been reduced or eliminated. Document it and refine your knowledge each time you do it. So risk-based decision-making is dependent on a quality culture and a set of behaviors that promotes blame-free, scientifically justifiable, and well-documented investigations or issue resolution. It's a process that can be codified, structured, practiced, and embedded into the quality system. And it's a skill that can be learned and expertise in this area is critical to your role as a senior manager in the company. Finally, don't forget to view our record-breaking free webinar on the NSF YouTube channel. This webinar provides an in-depth summary of risk-based decision-making, theory and practice, and is completely free. We've now got hundreds of subscribers and hits on this channel right now. So don't be left behind. Keep in touch and best wishes for the future.